This is AutoLine This Week, the show that gets you inside the global automotive industry. Underwriting for the production of AutoLine This Week has been provided by RSM. for challenges specific to your business by working with trusted advisors who help turn obstacles into opportunities. Experience the power of being understood. RSM, Audit, Tax and Consulting for the Middle Market. And now, here's your host, John McElroy. Thanks for joining us on AutoLine this week. Today's discussion is all about the impact of the coronavirus on the automotive industry. What's going to happen? And to get into the discussion of that today, we've got Mark Wakefield from Alex Partners. Also joining us is Joe White from Reuters and Mike Kalias from the Wall Street Journal. Great having all of you guys here and let's see if we can figure something out. Mark, let me start with you. Uh, This industry burns through a lot of cash. I think in normal times, a General Motors, a Ford, a Volkswagen, a Toyota, burn through something like $2 billion every week, even though they've all amassed a big war chest to get through this. I don't see how they have enough cash to get to the end of the year. How do you see it? Uh, If they were not able to to produce cars till the end of the year, that would be true for just about all of the the ones outside of the ones with massive cash piles. And there's only a couple of those. So it really does take uh, the factories going again for them to start getting real revenue. Uh, but thankfully, no one's expecting their plans to be shut down through the end of the year. They're not. But I mean, and we'll get into more of this, too. Even if they resume production, it's not going to be at the former levels. Yeah. Are they going to generate enough cash to keep themselves going into next year? It, it looks like they will generate enough cash and have enough liquidity. You're seeing bond markets open to to the automakers and to, the, to some suppliers. But the question then when you go tap those things is does that cripple you going into next year and the year after because now your debt load is so much higher yeah mike you watch this what what do you think is going on do they have enough cash to get through this well unlike you know the last time around 2008 2009 you know i feel like the car companies have spent the last decade trying to convince anyone who would listen that they they're in good shape for the next downturn now this is not the downturn that anyone thought. I mean, this is unprecedented and having almost every plant in the world um, at one point down and, and the ones that make the money, the U.S. Uh, down for it's going to be probably close to two months. So they didn't plan for this and they've had to go out to the, the markets They both uh, both Ford and GM have drawn on their uh, their credit reserves. Uh, Ford is borrowing some money at some really expensive rates. But the good news is I think that most analysts think that the companies, even if they didn't resume production, for months could could last uh, well into well into the fall. Yeah, and Joe, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think I mean th- this is different, right? In mar- market. I mean, th- th- there's liquidity out there, as and in 2008, 2009, there wasn't. Um, I, I think the question is, you know, can they can they get their costs under control and 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 keep them under control um, without essentially eating the seed corn? I mean, can they continue to invest in in all the stuff that they were investing in six months ago? Uh, and if not, how much, how much, how, how lean do they have to get and, and how tough are the decisions going to be to conserve cash and, and, you know, and, and probably not just the OEMs, right, but, but all, but all, all the, cust- the companies in the chain, um, rental car companies, I mean, you know, what happens to them? Can they keep buying cars if there's, if, if, if travel is as uh, depressed uh, six months from now or a year from now as it is right now? I mean, there's, so there's just a lot of uncertainty here to, to work through. Yeah. Yeah, And even though we've been just talking about the automakers now, Joe, you raise a good point. The whole supply chain, Mark, uh, how strong financially is the supply chain when you especially get down to the tier threes and tier fours, the smaller companies? And guess what? If they're not making parts, I don't care how good your finances are as an automaker. You're not going to resume production. Yeah, there's a lot of support that's needed from banks, from the automakers, from lenders, from even the equity holders of a lot of suppliers down in the chain. There was, uh, uh, we had, I think, 20 to 30 on our highly distressed list. We've now got hundreds uh, on our list that we track. Um, and we have 
a lot of suppliers facing a big hit when they start ramping up production, they're not going to get paid for 45 days, 60 days. And so they've got a hole to, to, to fill. Now, the automakers have come out with some plans to allow them to pull ahead receivables for a discount. Uh, but there's a lot of pain there in a small section, but a growing section of the supply base that automakers and tier ones need to be very worried about. Mark, do you, do you, I mean, and I know that you don't like to name names and I'm not really asking you to, but do you see that, that some of what the, the liquidity that the big automakers have, have, have pulled in, that some of that's going to have to go out to, to salvage suppliers uh, down in the tiers that, that they can't live without? Yeah. Absolutely. Some of it's going to go out and it's not just, in in payables and payables uh, as you saw from from some of the automakers they were aligning with banks so that they can do basically like a factoring where okay for for five percent you can pull ahead your receivables and be paid in five days instead of 45 days that sort of thing uh, that helps on the cash flow obviously hurts on you getting a five percent haircut on that um, but it it doesn't then allow you to it's a long ramp up that you're spending as a tier one and not receiving it in, eventually you need to unwind that. Um, otherwise you're stuck with a 5% haircut. And so that helps for the ones that have just a little bit of a nudge that's helped along. There are ones that are in deeper trouble, but even the supply base overall isn't nearly in as bad shape as the rental car market, as you were saying, Joe. That's a much deeper hit. Yeah, uh, Mark, um... What kind of advice are you giving to your clients in the automotive industry, both at the OEM and the supplier level and the like? What, what, I mean, Alex Partners is, <laughs> this is the perfect storm for you guys in a way. You know, you give advice to these companies and boy, do they need it. So what are you telling them? It depends a lot on the company's position going in. So some people need to husband cash as much as possible and try to change the very ingrained views of how different functions or different regions within those operate. Most companies operate as P&L oriented companies and they don't really look at cash. Uh, they look at the P&L and they're graded on the P&L and they're not graded on cash as much. So there's a lot of effort on people across the spectrum of health to say, look now at cash, understand cash and control when cash is going in, what isn't. There's the then medium term ideas of, okay, structural cost reductions, decisions on where to play are different now than they were in the future, than they were in the past uh, for what, for you know, electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, these things that won't pay off now. Uh, does the calculus that was going into this still work? There's a lot of changes there, but husbanding cash, getting your control of understanding your cash flow, cash and credit, because without those, you're out of business and restarts and all those plans don't matter if you're out of business and you have no cash or credit. Then into the restart plans, which are really difficult because it gets into you know, getting people to not pass each other in the hallways into the very granular things and the communication of that to, to convince people that it's safe to come back to work. And then the dealings and negotiatings with suppliers and bankers and lenders, as well as customers on those restarts. And beyond that, you've got private equity circling, looking for weak ones to pick off. Uh, you've got other bankers and lenders who are also interested in in making sure they get paid 100 cents on the dollar when right now their debt's trading far below that. And so a lot of stakeholders to manage through a planned restart, which hasn't happened yet, but a planned restart, and then um, some very different calculus on the long term notes. Mark, I'm interested in what in, in what you're seeing um, as you look at Asia, China, and in and, and the next few weeks in, in Europe um, as to the trajectory of the kind of the reopening of the market. Because if, if, so you, yeah. you've heard some of the optimistic stuff coming out of OEMs in China about how that market appears to be rebounding. I'm yeah. really interested in your view of that. Is that is that a, or can we read that to other markets? And, and yeah, what do you make of all of that? Uh, I think you have to take a bit of it with a grain of salt because there's a fair bit of stimulus that got pushed back into that market. Um, and so the auto production, auto sales did bounce back quite sharply in, in China to, to near basically to prior levels. We had one week above prior levels. Um, but the sectors in China, uh, hospitality sectors, other ones are still going to be impacted. So there is still a, a longer term impact there, but there's been a snapback in China that we don't expect um, anywhere near as high in the US and really 
very little of in Europe. So the, our European forecasts are much more muted. Our U.S. one is 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 somewhat of a V-shape, but then it tails off and assumes no no second wave. In China, assuming no second wave, it looks like a highly stimulus-driven um, uh, V-shape. Mark, it seems like the supply chain, you know, it seems like there's myriad threats, right? I mean, I've, I've talked to an attorney who said that he's got a few mom and pop clients who are saying, you know, I'm not sure I feel comfortable sending my people back in. Um, you know, it takes a couple of those, you know, and I know that the, the, the industry is expert at working around those things. But uh, and then once, you know, when they're back in, if you get an, an outbreak, I mean, I think the big car companies are going to be pretty good at protecting their people. It might not be the case as you go up the tiers um, an outbreak at, at a few supplier plants could be an issue. And then I hear a lot of people talking about Mexico, too. And if Mexico is as prepared uh, and, and, you know, as rigorous in their planning to restart as the U.S. is. Yeah, I think this is a big challenge for the mantra in the industry of safety first. You know, that's always been the mantra forever uh, because people need to feel safe in their environment. This is usually it's machines and things people are worried about. Uh, but in this case, it's still people's lives and it's an impact beyond the people in the plant. So you're seeing a lot of interesting things. You know, Ferrari's app that tracks their people was a pretty neat thing that, that, that Ferrari is trying. You're seeing another bunch of other automakers using some tools to try to, to keep track of people coming in. You know, obviously the resources of a Ferrari are not the same as the resources of a little tool shop in Windsor, Ontario, or, or somewhere in Trezzo, Mexico. So you've got a big range, and the smaller places uh, are basically looking to the larger ones to, to take their cues from. Um, but when you lose, let's say you lose you know, half of your tool shop to, to an outbreak, um, there's really not much you can do to get that tool back online. So it's not even just the suppliers, it's also equipment suppliers, uh, tool shops, uh, integrators, things like that. Mark, I had missed that. What, what was Ferrari doing exactly? Uh, they have an app that basically tracks contacts and tracks health and allows people to get health. And it goes into you know, all of the people in the family, in the nuclear family, in the household are supposed to have this. Uh, suppliers going into Ferrari's sites have it. And it's a means of, of trying to help them um, understand what's going on, contact trace, be able to do remote screening rather than waiting until the person's at the door and giving the IR scan to the forehead and such. Yeah, they're doing testing as well, I think, at Ferrari. They've, they're sponsoring their own testing. Yeah. Um, it is really interesting. Um, I don't know how transferable it is to, you know, or scalable that is to, you know, a larger or less, less wealthy company, right? And Mark, I think that's what you're talking about. But it I is, think it seems to be pretty big. Oh, it is. Go ahead. I'd love to hear your views on I mean, that. It, it is scalable to some degree because the, the concepts of, you know, we have smaller suppliers who are buying thermometers and sending those home with their people. A little, little more old school than the app, but it's the same sort of concept. Um, there's also uh, traveling uh, nurses and traveling medical people who can buy kits for $150 to do a testing. And so it's not an outrageous cost to set up the, the, the testing, the ability of someone to remotely go to those people, their household or, or to your plant or to your site. Um, those aren't out of the, those are being done, but to John's point earlier, um, it just takes one part to be missing to be able to, to shut down the chain. Mark, I'm interested. You said you see a V shape to this uh, downturn i.e., you know, a, a strong comeback in the U.S., assuming that there's no second wave of this virus. Uh, what makes you so confident it's going to bounce back? Well, bounce back to a lower level. Um, you get the automakers right now have not a real desire to be pushing volume. Um, so they will, though, once they get you know a few months into the restart and their production starts to exceed the, the natural demand that's out there because you have sectors of the U.S. economy that are devastated. And so that demand is just gone. You know, oil and gas, a lot of retail, a lot of other things. So the 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 assumption is that there's uh, quite a bit of, of incentive and stimulus from the suppliers, or sorry, from the OEMs, as well as possibly from the government. Once that production starts to exceed the demand after a few months of a restart, um, but it's it's a V-shape only in the sense of getting back to, you know, a, 
we have it from 11.2 to 13.7 as a range, far cry from uh, the, for this year, a far cry from from the 17 million of last year, and we have next year uh, at 15 million again plus or minus. So you know, 15 million is not a V shape back to its former, um, but it is a healthy amount where you don't have mass um, overcapacity. You have more targeted overcapacity and a, a resetting of profitability versus a, a 2009 crisis level. What's your uh, outlook on used cars then, Mark? I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, we've seen prices collapse. That's going to make it harder for consumers who want to get a new car to get a decent value on their trade in. We're seeing yeah. all cars, kinds of cars, millions, a couple of million coming off lease right now. Uh, the value of them has obviously gone down too. That's going to be a big hit to the automakers and, and leasing companies that put a residual value on those vehicles that no longer ha has anything to do with reality. How much of an impact does used cars have on your scenario? Uh, it has quite a bit. It's, it's, right now it's gone, it's a little tough to, to look at how far it's gone down and say, what does that do by the end of the year? But the, the amount of cars coming back from lease doesn't stop. You can push them out three months, do other sort of things with, with consumers, cost quite a bit of money. But you will see automakers taking pretty extraordinary actions or to protect residuals or build back residuals. They need a decent residual to be able to lease a vehicle. And so they, they're going to be putting money to support those. And it's, so how will they do How would they do that, Mark? I mean, when you say extraordinary actions, what kinds of things could they do? So they can work with the auction companies, first of all, to, to basically be the buyer of last resort and to protect a downside just by funding the, down, the, the, the bottom and making sure that the vehicles get moved around, get more reconditioned, get other things to improve their price. Um, they can also do quite a bit on their own used car offerings, so CPOV leasing. CPOV finance rates, um, CPOV rebates. They can drive through their dealerships and support their dealerships too by doing it. Uh, CPOV programs that really don't have too much to deal with new cars, but what they do is they support the residuals that allows them to write new cars at a, at a more reasonable uh, rate. So as a consumer, I might not see a rock bottom used car price. It might be, they, they might try to offer the, a used vehicle at kind of the price they would prefer. Well, you might see great financing, though, or le okay. and, lease deal, and lease deals that you and very few automakers. They've tiptoed into it last year, but most automakers don't lease their through their captive uh, used cars. But you'll, you'll likely see more of that as well because they really do need to – it matters for their new car sales. And so it's worth often putting money into that. It also is a little better than training the customer on just cash rebates. Mark, maybe yeah. more of a more of a medium term question, but what do you, what do you see, if any, impact on on portfolio and, and the vehicle lineup? I mean, we already saw, you know, the, the companies sort of you know treading or, or trimming their lineups to you know get rid of passenger cars. I mean, are, are they going to retrench even more uh, toward the stuff that's more profitable? Yeah, I think so. I think it, it does make sense to take another fine look at that. You know, we've been helping uh, clients through that as well. It's a tough one because you know, everyone had a very strong business case for whatever they wanted to do. The reality is those business cases are different than when they got green lit right now. And they need to be looked at again uh, because you obviously want your cash engines, your profit engines to drive. You obviously want to keep investing for the future. Uh, but there's a lot in between those two posts um, that are possibly delayed, reduce the, the, the mid-cycle, lengthen the mid-cycle, uh, change the amount of cash you're having to put in and get a little bit more um, entrepreneurial about how you keep your vehicles fresh that don't have the cash flow and profitability um, that warrant them getting the same equal treatment as a, a big SUV or a big truck or or the strategic importance of a, of a coming electric vehicle. Mark, do you see companies, and not just OEMs, but also suppliers, um, rethinking or, or backing away from investments in autonomy and electrification? I mean, because both of those things are, you know, promise for the future, but no cash flow today kinds of propositions, right? 
Yeah, and the, I mean, the, the autonomous one had been already happening. We'd already started to see some walking back and walking into ADAS of it. This is sort, certainly exacerbated because when you start to look back at your cash flow and you say, okay, here's how many months I have, you know, that's, and your plants are actually down, that's a very different environment to be looking at your portfolio. And it lets you choose what really is a need versus what is a want uh, in a way that would have been very difficult last year. And sometimes some of the autonomous programs, some of the other pilots are running into that problem where there isn't a clear path towards profitability and a reason to go do it uh, for that company to go do it. Electric vehicles have been generally more protected in the in the decisions, um, and they're a little more near term. Uh, but again, the calculus has to be how much cash flow can I afford to put into this, and so which ones of these can I perhaps slim down on or delay, um, at least until the cash flow comes back. And so, the idea of protecting your trough, you know, how low does your cash get? Um, forces a decision that can sometimes be quite uncomfortable. You know, uh, I, I hear what you're saying about uh, electric vehicles, but in many markets, even in the U.S., uh, with the California ZEV mandate, they have to come out with these cars. Do you yeah. sense at all? I, I don't see it that maybe there's going to be some back off in those regulations. Yeah, we do expect that. Uh, we do expect some practicality in the European and the U.S., um, uh, regulations, and you're already seeing uh, almost a weekly change in on the margin, but in China, uh, on the NEV, up and down and up and down, and different regions dealing with uh, different provinces dealing with it differently. Um, so certainly, the the regulatory holiday from a from an uptick or from something is is in the cards. Mark, you mentioned private equity, private equity um, earlier on, and um, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. I mean, do you see private equity, you know, basically using chaos as a ladder uh, to, to kind of consolidate and, and get a foothold in, in uh, the auto sector? Uh, absolutely, especially the ones that, that know it already. So instead of a foothold, it's more of, of opportunistically going in. You know, the, the classic private equity move is to buy into the debt at half the value and then credit bid that debt in a bankruptcy or in some other way to loan to own called of, of going into suppliers, particularly the more troubled ones, because you know, people going in just like just like uh, you and me going in, if we had underlying conditions, when a business goes into this with underlying conditions, this is this is near fatal. And sometimes private equity is the only uh, last person offering and standing as a buyer. And so we're seeing some of that, particularly around the smaller ones uh, on the, the larger ones. Private equity hasn't moved in to a high degree yet. There hasn't been big buyouts. Um, we've been helping them with outside in due diligences and things like that. So there's a lot of sniffing around, but the the uncertainty of, of how fast a snapback comes uh, makes a lot of people not want to get into M&A discussions at the moment when they feel their prices are depressed, if they think they can last. So it's really the distress side that we're seeing with private equity real action now versus preparation. Mike, Joe, I'm, I'm curious to get your reaction to what Mark said of uh, some sort of regulatory relief possibly coming. Mike, wh why don't we start with you? How, how do you see it? Oh, I, I certainly think on the stimulus side, I, I think there's yet another tranche that the industry is looking for, you know, specific to the auto industry this time from the government. I think there, you know, there's a lot of discussions already happening in DC on that, whether it looks like a cash for clunkers or something else, you know, th that, those fights are going to get interesting because you're going to have the Democrats really pushing, you know, sort of green, a green car element to that at a time where you've got a buck 40 <laughs> gallon of gas, right? It's or even be, less, right? Right. Yeah. So, but I, I, they're, they're working on that and it's hard to see demand really uh, snapping back to any real significant level unless they, unless they do get some stimulus. Yeah, general, yeah, I'd, regular. Yeah, I'd, yeah, I'd agree with that. I'd agree with that. And I'd say that you're getting a preview of this already in some other markets uh, outside the U.S. where the debate over, you know, do you, do you have a stimulus? Well, these answers, yeah, we should have a stimulus. Well, then what is it structured to do? You know, is it structured to, to sell, uh, you know, Teslas or is it structured to sell, you know, Renaults, you know, uh, in, in obviously talking about Europe. 
So I think that's going to be an interesting fight to watch, not just in the United States, but also in, the, in these other in, the, in these other markets. Yeah, Mark, and what do you think? A, a second tranche coming? Uh, yeah, I think both company stimulus, market stimulus, as well as some relief on uh, you know particularly in Europe, some of the the requirements of what has to happen is pretty logical given what's happened. Logic doesn't always work its way through the whole political chain, uh, but it would seem logical to do. I mean, you just look at the EV market and, and the gas price is falling from 280 last year at about 160 now. Um, you know, that, that dramatically changes the consumer's view of, should I buy it? You know, in, our, in our surveys, it always comes out number one is that the actual gas price and in the, 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 not the environmental impact, but the actual economics of buying a, an electric vehicle for people. And you know, the, the payback period just doubled in the last year because of the gas price dropping so much. I don't know, the, the people I know that are buying electric cars, they don't care about the price of gasoline. They want an electric. I, I know that, but it's, it's when you look at the broad group and our surveys show this again and again, environmental, you know, it, it used to come in as nothing. It came, it's, it's creeping up and creeping up, but it's, it's a long way from the number one issue. It's the number two, and it's the number on the flip side, um, things like range and things, uh, the other concerns are still there. So the calculus is invariably worse for an electric vehicle right now. And a lot of people hey, do look at the, the price of gas. We're gonna have to wrap this up. I hope to do this again, maybe in another six months, where hopefully we'll be talking about much more positive things. But Mark Wakefield, Joe White, Mike Elias, thanks so much, you guys. Very interesting insights into what's going on right now. Thanks, John. Thanks. Thanks, John. Underwriting for the production of AutoLine this week has been provided by RSM. for challenges specific to your business by working with trusted advisors who help turn obstacles into opportunities. Experience the power of being understood. RSM, audit, tax and consulting for the middle market.